monads are infamous. It seems like the majority of developers have some strong opinions about them. We'll talk a bit about their purpose and their alternatives, old and new. A little known fact, monads were introduced into functional programming because Haskell is lazy, or actually non-strict. Before we look into Haskell, let's look at strict languages. Mainstream languages such as Java, JavaScript, Python, and so on are based on strict evaluation. The expressions are evaluated when they are bound to a name, and the function arguments are evaluated before they apply to a function. Let's start with a simple snippet in a strict pseudo language. We have some functions that takes three parameters, print something, and returns only the second parameter. Then we declare C and call second first with one, second, and third parameter, and print the result. In this example, C is evaluated and printed first, then A, then B, and so on. Such an evaluation strategy, roughly speaking, allows us to read the code in sequential order, up to down or left to right. This might be taken for granted, but we can show and observe this because the side effects, like printing to the console, are executed during the evaluation of the expression, where they are defined. We evaluate C and print its side effect, same for A, same for B, and so on. On the other hand, having this natural, in quotes, evaluation order and tying execution to evaluation the same way is not an option in Haskell. Haskell is non-strict. In a similar snippet, A and C are never used and never evaluated. We don't even try to translate the rest of the snippet into Haskell. It wouldn't make much sense. The non-strictness raises too many questions. Would it even print evaluate in A? If so, when? It's not used. If we call the second function multiple times, should we print evaluate in A multiple times as well? It's not strict. Luckily for us, we can avoid philosophizing by using monads. The idea is that we can embed these native side effects in a data type and describe the sequence in using functions. By native side effects, we mean effects provided by the runtime or the runtime system, for example, printing to the console, exceptions, interacting with the file system, and so on. For example, we can use a put string line function that returns IO. We start with first print statement, and then we return three, and then we print another statement, and then we do something else, and so on and so on, until we get to the result and we print and show the result. And when we run this Haskell program, we once again see log messages we've seen before. Evaluating C, evaluating A, evaluating B until we get to the result. Okay, but why are we using monads and monolike things outside of Haskell, where we don't have this laziness issue? Turned out that monads are great not just for modeling native effects, but also for any custom or user-defined effects. And the actual superpower of monads is the embedding of control flow. In other words, we can abstract control flow and various patterns as data types, and use functions over values. Control flow is the order of execution, the pass a program takes, based on instructions like conditions, loops, and function calls. For instance, do x, then do y, and depending on some condition, do s or that, using a conditional, using if then else, for example. In traditional programming languages, the set of control flow patterns is fixed. Expanding it requires additional features, such as try catch, while and for loops, async and await, and so on. Sometimes we can represent complex patterns using simpler building blocks. For example, we can represent loops using conditional, aka if then else. But writing loops from scratch quickly becomes cumbersome. So usually we get built-in loops. Another example is checking if the value exists, checking for null, nil, or whatever your language has. It can be implemented using a simple check as well. If something equals null, we do this. If it's not, we do something else. And it also doesn't scale well. That's why languages like Kotlin and Rust provide operators or special syntax to safely chain and deal with nullable values, which are pretty much monads in disguise. We represent optionality as data types and use function over values. And it's not just optionality. We can model various concepts such as exceptions, iterating or loops, synchronous asynchronous programming, parsing, finalizing or closing resources, dependency injection, cancellation, and on and on with monads and monad-like things. Here is just a small snippet with handling errors, iterating, and asynchronous programming. The largest recent monadization we can observe in the string and mainstream languages is around asynchronous programming, reactive streams in Java, futures in Scala, promises in JavaScript, and many other places. Eventually, languages catch up and acquire some sort of async await syntax or lightweight threads. But it takes time. For example, Java finally obtained virtual threads, see Project Loom. But we've been doing asynchronous programming in Java thanks to monads for more than 10 years already. This is the real superpower of monads. This is why we use monads. They allow us, developers, to have more control over the flow of the program. However, let's not lie to ourselves. 
This is not the nicest snippet of code. Look at all the plumbing we have to do with monads. We describe the sequencing of effects using explicit combinators. It's nice that we have unified syntax for various effects. In this case, bind and return in other languages, it's pure and flat map and so on. But it's less nice that we have to deal with all of this noise and syntax overhead. And it's also a cognitive overhead. We would not have a phenomenon of monad tutorials and hate towards monads if this wasn't the case. And let's not even talk about monad transformers and problems with mixing effects. Direct style or code without monads is straightforward. Effects are executed during the evaluation of an expression. Most of the code is just do this and do that. In this case, we execute foo and pass the result to a bar. Sometimes, if we need to prevent execution, we can explicitly suspend evaluation. In this case, we pass the foo itself into the function. We don't want to evaluate foo and don't want to execute its effects because we want the retry function to do that. In the monadic world, foo is already do foo. It's already suspended. We can pass things to functions, return them as results, and so on. In this snippet, we pass the foo itself into the function. And it's amazing for building control flows and writing composable code, but we end up juggling two layers all the time, the layer of constructing it and the layer of when it will execute. Here we want to pass the result of foo to bar, which looks nice and simple on the slide, but this is texting on an untrained brain. This is where we lose people. And note that in a strict language, it can also trip up advanced people, not just beginners. For example, this causes a stack overflow error in Scala with cats. So it might hurt to admit, but because most of the code is plain do this and do that, on average, it's simpler to write and redirect style code because thinking about one level at a time is less demanding than thinking about two. Direct style is simple, yes, but only when it's possible. Each feature or control foil mechanism needs to be supported by the language and usually comes with its own syntax. Another trade-off is effect tracking. The effects are not typed and it's not as painful to mix different effects. On the one hand, it's still easier to teach. On the other hand, it comes with annoying properties such as lack of referential transparency and some presence of function coloring, which depends on the particular implementation. If you know, you know. Even though the whole function coloring can be frustrating with monads as well. Have you ever had to replace a bunch of maps with traverse when you introduce just one additional monad, such as adding a lock in a deeply nested function? If you have three functions and then string becomes a yo string for some reason, then everybody else, the function number two, also returns an IO now, and we cannot use map anymore, we have to use traverse, which affects the third function, option of string becomes IO of option of string, and this map also becomes a traverse as well, and on and on. Can we do better? Naturally, we want to have our cake and eat it too, so we end up with having both, the cons of both. We're stuck in this world because we want the power of monads to embed user-defined effects and control flows, but at the same time, we never handle the hate of monads. Some effects are controlled by evaluation, like in direct style, and some by explicit combinators in monadic style. As a result, we lose both the immediacy of the former and the systematic clarity of the latter. Uh, however, we don't have to stay here. Meet direct style algebraic effects, also known as effect handlers, and ambiguously as algebraic effect. Actually, they're not very well known, that's why they're known by different names and come in many different forms. Today we focus on abilities, Unison's implementation of algebraic effects. Let's start with my favorite example, division by zero. If we try to divide by zero, we're gonna encounter an exception, which gonna tell us that we try to divide by zero. We can build a safer version by utilizing exception ability. You can see the exception ability in the type signature, we use exception raise constructor to capture failure details, which are not very interesting in this case. We just say failure, oops, we got a zero, and we pass back a zero, which is not very useful, whatever. If we try to naively run or evaluate it, we get a compilation error. Unison is not happy. It says that this expression is the ability, so either we need to handle it or provide it. In this case, we can use catch handler, which translates the exception into a value of type either. Ignore the do for now. If we try to divide by zero, we get a failure. But if we try to divide something else, we get it right. In this case, one. The handlers for effects, such as catch, is the impressive part of the concept, but we're not gonna look too deep into it here. Let's try something more exciting and randomly generate both numbers with the IO ability. Imagine fetching numbers from the external service or something like that. Not that there is a dedicated random ability that lets you generate stuff more properly. We use IO random for research purposes. There are a couple of new things in this snippet. 
we force or execute the computation of IOS random net to get two random natural numbers for A and for B. And we delay or suspend the whole save D function. In other words, it's kind of waiting for a parameter, like in this case, and it's also reflected in the type signature. The idea behind forcing should be straightforward. But why should we delay a computation? The unforced or just by itself type that has ability IO and exception by itself is not allowed there because IO and exception abilities must be provided by some handler. The runtime can do it for us when we run the whole program. Notice we just run and we don't use any catch or anything like that. As a result, we get something boring like zero or maybe one. Because this is such a significant part, Unison provides an alternative syntax for forced and delayed computation. Instead of suspending like this, we can use do, which does exactly the same thing. We can also use an alternative syntax for delaying computation by using tick. And then force random naturals using exclamation point instead of unit. This version does the same and produces the same boring result. Let's make it fun by involving another ability. For example, let's store some things. We can use a store ability to store randomly generated division components. After we generated two numbers, we can put it inside the store. Everything else stays the same. If we try to run it, it's not gonna work. Because this time we must provide a handler for store. Unison cannot just guess or handle it for us. We can use with initial value function and provide some empty text. Let's make it more interesting, get the result as well, and then print everything. We can get the stuff out of store with get, print the result as well, and once again, we need to not to forget to suspend everything. If we try to run this new program, we can see that we get one beautiful natural number again divided by another one. In a nutshell, direct style algebraic effect is just a nice interface over delimited continuations. As a reminder, exceptions, loops, asynchronous computations, finalizing or closing resources, dependency injection, cancellation, all of this requires some technique to jump through the function call stack. So instead of manipulating the call stack directly via custom fixture, we can use monads or some other instrument like delimited continuation to manipulate the stack. In direct style or with custom features, the compiler does that. We use nice syntax, compiler does all the job. With monads, we can manipulate the data structure that reifies the call stack. So the library developers do all the job, we just use it. monads. With delimited continuations, we can use user-level primitives to affect the call stack as well. But it's quite mind-breaking, so nobody wants that. With direct style algebraic effects, such as abilities, we can use delimited continuation. We have better, friendlier interface. And what do we have now? Right up front, we get the ability to embed user-defined effects a massive improvement over traditional direct style, plus the ability to write code in direct style, a considerable improvement in expressing control flow. We have not demonstrated this, but writing custom effects is more accessible than monads. You have to trust us on that. Writing custom monads is an upper intermediate or expert only in DevGuard, especially when you have to deal with tech safety in a strict language. At the same time, there is a limited amount of syntax. The language designers must make a few choices around effect handlers, suspending and forcing computations. We saw two variations in the case of Unison. Still, there is no need to make a new syntax for every feature, which leads us to teaching and learning. Teaching people how to use effects is trivial. Essentially, you need to grasp delaying and forcing. Remember how easy it was to add the store ability to existing abilities? We keep typed effects and peacefully mix them. And on top of that, no more function coloring at all. There is no map traverse distinction or anything like that. But nothing comes for free. This might sound dramatic for people coming from monadic worlds, but the first thing we lose with direct style algebraic effects is referential transparency. Imagine we have a program that initializes two mutable refs with empty, an X and a Y. And then it writes full into one of them, into the first one, into the X, and then reads values from the both of them. If we run this ref example, we get full and empty. The X is full and the Y is empty. We might want to decide to dry out this code and extract the empty initialization into some empty ref. And then instead of doing it twice, we just do it this way. And if we run this, we get a whole different program. We get full and full because both X and Y were updated because they are the same ref, which is not what we wanted. What we wanted to do is to suspend the initialization here, for example, with do, 
and then force it twice. First time for x and second time for y. Running this gives us original stuff. Full and empty again what we had in the beginning. As you can see, refactoring the code with abilities might require more brain activity than with monads. Even though it's a hurdle for people with monadic background, it's not the end of the world. Remember that even though we gave up something important, we also gained a ton. The drawbacks don't stop there. Direct style algebraic effects is an old concept, even comparatively to monads. There are still some questions and some unknowns. We need some time to explore the limitations. For example, static control fall is a niche use case, for example, in build tools, which is well expressed with monads and friends, but cannot be expressed with direct style algebraic effects, because there is no way not to evaluate effects or do an effect and then undo an effect. Are there more cases like that? We don't know. But if you are curious and want to explore the knowns and unknowns, here are some pointers. First, I would recommend checking out Unison and its abilities. It's the most accessible place to start. It shouldn't take longer than three minutes to get it started. OCaml supports effect handlers, which are a bit different from Unison's abilities. They are more powerful because they're multi-core, but dynamically typed, since multi-core OCaml doesn't have an effect system. But research is still going on. It seems like the next major Scala feature will be capabilities, another take on direct style algebraic effects. If you are a Scala developer, Keep an eye on the project Caprice. The limited continuation have recently been landed in GHC, the main Haskell compiler. Cannot point you to an algebraic effect system or a library that makes full use of it at that moment, but if you're interested, it might be a good time to poke or ask around. And last but not least, check out the doobie doo paper on Frank, a strict functional programming language designed from the ground up around effect handlers. At the end of the day, direct style algebraic effects or the limited continuations and monads have the same expressive power we can express the same things. The questions are, which one will be less painful to use? And will either one stick around in the future? Also, if you've been hoarding Monad tutorials, maybe it's time to sell, but it's not a financial advice.